Okay, welcome everyone to, to, to tonight's uh, session. Uh, before I turn the mic over to uh, our presenter, I'd like to remind you that uh, we have two more sessions for this series. We will be meeting again Thursday night at 7 Eastern, and we will meet again on Saturday, uh, October 5th at 11 a.m. Eastern. So please mark your calendar and plan to uh, join us. Um, the system is populating, Mark. So uh, if you want uh, to, you, uh, you might want to say some things that you will repeat or that are not <laughs> as important to the class because okay. the system is still populating. All right. Thanks, Dee. Um, so um, my goal for this whole series was to give you all the tools necessary for an analysis of the fundamental features of fascism. And I, I know that I crammed a lot of material into the first session. Hopefully there will be a little more time for discussion tonight uh, and in the, re the remaining uh, two sessions. Uh, I'll try not to be quite as talkative, and we also have several reports from students who volunteered to present on uh, different sections of Dimitrov's speech. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how these tools fit together. We need an understanding of the dialectical method because that's the foundation in my opinion, on which other elements of Marxist theory rest. That's the method that Marx and Engels used to study history, to study economics, to keep up with the then most current science. So we need an understanding of that method. So that's why we talked about dialectics at the start. That helps us get to the root of whatever it is we're studying. Second, we need to look at the history of fascism. So we start from a materialist understanding of what has really happened, not um, you know, various delusions or illusions or emotional reactions, but the reality of what it has been. Three, we need to understand partly by looking at history and uh, partly you know, as an extension of historical materialism, uh, to try and understand why fascist movements gain power and why that happens at a particular point in time. Because there have been, uh, ever since the beginning of fascism, there have been fascists with us in this country and in many countries around the world. But for many decades after following World War II, they were, um, uh, you know, uh, a, a little uh, less less seen and less thought about and uh, almost universally reviled section of the body politic. But now we see over the past 10 years, we've seen a, a rise in that, maybe a little more than 10 years, uh, going back to the Tea Party. Um, explosion. We've seen uh, encouragement of the fascist movements and permission for it and uh, encouragement and uh, support for it. Uh, so why is that happening at this point in time and not say 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago? Why now? Um, um, Mark, for, yeah. Okay, something is clicking and it will um, affect uh -oh. the quality of the recording. Okay, that might be my uh, headset, little headset thing on the keyboard. I'll make sure it's off. Okay. Uh, and then fourth, we need to look at the issues, movements, and balance of forces in the current moment to develop the best strategy to defeat fascism. So that's how I see these tools, the dialectical method, uh, a look at the history of fascism, and then a careful look at the current moment and the current balance of forces. Uh, and that leads us to our best strategy. So this first session started with a fairly quick review of the dialectical method, and we also looked carefully at the classic Marxist definition of fascism. The session tonight will look more closely at some particular questions about fascism and its history. I'll start by addressing three issues. 
One is an ideological point and the other two are some details about violence, fascism, elections, and timing. Uh, then we're going to hear from three participants who volunteered to take sections of Dimitrov's speech and to share those lessons with us, followed by hopefully some extended time for discussion. So get your questions and comments ready. And that includes if you want me to go back over uh, something from the first session, don't hesitate to ask. The session on Thursday, we'll hear several participants who are, uh, will talk about uh, several of Togliati's lectures on fascism, and I'll discuss some of the history of the, of, uh, the, the socialist movement and the uh, fascist imposition of fascism in Chile, the period from 1970 to 1973, which also holds important lessons for us. And the last sec session on Saturday will focus on how to use the dialectical method to develop strategy and finish on our party's program as it relates to the struggle against fascism. So the three issues that I'm going to begin with today uh, is one the issue of street violence and the morality or immorality of pun punching fascists in the face. Two, we'll look about, talk about the importance of fighting racism and anti-Semitism as a central, has to be a central element of the fight against fascism. And three, I'll uh, hopefully expose the myth that Hitler was elected. Uh, following that, we'll hear uh, some reports on Dimitrov's speech. So some have asked, this was particularly true in the period right after uh, Charlottesville, um, and there was a, a famous uh, little uh, clip of uh, a prominent fascist, I think his name was Richard Spencer, who got punched in the face. So the people ask, is it moral to punch fascists in the face? Well, look at strictly as a moral question. Of course, it's moral to punch fascists. They have given up uh, any pretense of being normal actors on the political stage. And their program, once you get behind the demagoguery and the, uh, the whatever they put out for public consumption, their program is based on violence, oppression, and even murder. I contend, however, that the question is the wrong question to ask. Because violence as a tactic alienates the very millions of people we need to win in order to defeat fascism. The real question is not, is it moral to punch a fascist in the face? It's how do we successfully defeat fascism? And uh, there's, you know, people who, who want to have counter protests against the fascists, which is great, uh, but some people want to take advantage of that to engage in, in violence. And if it's, we don't look at it as a moral issue, but rather as an issue of how can we put together uh, a coalition of them and a, a, a united front and a popular front of all the people who are uh, ready to fight fascism, uh, then we come to a different understanding. If we look at the history of the fascists in both Italy and Germany, there were years of pitched street battles between the militias associated with the Nazi party and the Communist Party. In fact, in Germany, all of the major political parties uh, had uh, organizations of ex-servicemen who were uh, as a sort of an adjunct of the, their parties. And those parties, but notably the Nazis and the Communist Party, did engage in numerous street battles. And the fascists, in fact, welcomed them even when they lost the street battle. It contributed to an atmosphere where uh, the great political center of the country was horrified at the chaos that was assuming, that was uh, ensuing. And the fascists uh, argued that only their brutal militarism uh, was the only way to keep uh, chaos uh, under control and to, to put it down and to stop it from disrupting the, 
the profits and the companies and the country. Um, they welcome chaos in the streets, which is why they work so hard to provoke and instigate it. And they bolster, in doing so, Trump's argument that he is all that stands in the way of anarchy. And they point to their own street battles as evidence of uh, their being willing to uh, take the fight to, to uh, prevent anarchy and communism and Marxism and all those terrible, terrible things. So chaos in the streets aids fascism. Uh, this is a quote from a book called The Lessons of Germany, uh, published by International Publishers in 1945. In Germany, before Hitler's accession to power, tens of thousands of workers, both social democrats and communists, in their militant organizations did not capitulate to reaction. They stood their ground against the Nazi gangs. Throughout 1932, bloody clashes occurred between Nazi stormtroopers on one side and communists and social democrats on the other side. Characteristically, the, the local authorities always sent the police to help the Nazis. And uh, the second quote is from a review of a book by Ruth ben Giat. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Uh, the fascist Italian dictator before he ascended to power in October exploited violent clashes between groups of his supporters known as the black shirts and their left wing opponents. He used the violence to destabilize Italian society so he could position himself as the person to stop this violence. So it's not a moral position strictly to oppose violence in the streets and punching fascists in the face. It's a key element of taking away one of their tools and uh, building unity with the millions of people who don't see the need to, uh, vi to vi oppose the fascists by any means necessary, but are opposed to the fascists. Those are the very key to our being able to defeat them. So we have to, how do we reach them? How do we enlist them in the struggle? How do we convince them that it's possible for them to join without risking their lives yet? So here's Dimitrov again. Lenin had in mind the fundamental law of all great revolutions, the law that for the masses, propaganda and agitation alone cannot take the place of their own political experience. So our entire strategy, not just against fascism, but our entire strategy for the current stage of struggle against the extreme right, is to help move more millions of people into motion so they can learn from their own political experience. And once they learn from their own political experience, then our agitation and propaganda make sense to them because it matches their lived experience. So we want to draw increasingly wide masses into the revolutionary class struggle proceeding from their vital interests and from their own experience. Uh, that's a quote from Dimitrov also. Masses in motion, masses in struggle is the path on which workers and allies gain experience, knowledge, and work out their alliances. Uh, this is true of all forms of struggle, but most particularly of the struggle for democracy. This is the field on which those alliances and coalitions and uh, uh, broad-based opposition to fascism can be built. Without their own experience, workers will not learn why what we say matters. They won't be necessary, uh, ready to forge the necessary alliances, and they won't be ready for the risks of struggle. Uh, and by the way, one of the main goals of uh, the violence and the uh, militarism of the fascists is to escalate those risks of struggle, to make it uh, make people fear for their lives if they engage in struggle, make them fear for their jobs, make them fear they'll be thrown in concentration camps, make them fear that they'll be deported. And that's to uh, use that fear to uh, place them um, 
to remove them from the field of, of political struggle to make the costs so high um, that people won't fight back. So it is necessary to be militantly anti-fascists, but that's not enough. We also need to ask the right questions. We need a smart reality-based strategy. We need a sober materialist strategy that starts with acknowledging that is Trump if Trump is going to be defeated at the ballot box this fall, it will have to be by votes for Harris. That's not a, um, a revisionist fantasy. That is the reality that we face. We don't have to like that reality. We don't have to like Biden or Harris or approve of their policy limitations, nor approve or agree with their support for imperialist policy, especially the financial, political, and military support for the genocide in Gaza, now in imminent danger of engulfing the entire Mideast. Nor do we have to like their history of compromise and tranquilization triangulation over immigration and crime bills. And it's it's been said, and it's very true, that another reason to oppose the fascists is that the Democrats are more likely to be um, affected by and adapt to pressure from millions of people, pressure from the struggle, pressure from uh, the millions of voters they want to win. But we do not have any guarantee that Harris or her administration or the Democrats in the House of Representatives or the Senate will bow to that pressure. We want to work for that. And we can aim for that. That can be our goal. But there isn't a guarantee. That, however, doesn't impact the basic strategic calculations that we need for right now. It's important to note that voting is not the end goal of our strategy. Voting is not all that is needed to defeat fascism. Uh, much more is needed. But the electoral arena is a crucial field of struggle that the left should not abandon or play games with. It's the next step in the struggles ahead of us. There are people who want to say, well, if you live in a swing, if you live in a, uh, not live in a swing state, if you live in a state that's reliably, reliably blue, you should be able to vote for a third party candidate because it won't matter. But the vote totals matter. <laughs> they do matter a lot. It's not something to play games with, especially not at this point, in my opinion. Um, so that's one of the historical points. Violence in the streets does not work on behalf of the left. It works on behalf of the right, and they take advantage of it, even when they get punched in the face. So that's one of the questions I wanted to address. Uh, the second is an ideological one. I noted that fascist movements are growing around the world, and they share some features that are similar around the world, but also nationally specific features. And let us also recognize that even in the shared features of fascists in different, different countries, those features are mixed into a different balance, depending on the uh, history and culture of those each country. For example, anti-Semitism was at the heart of the fascist program in Germany. They also attacked Slavic peoples as inferior, all the people of Russia and Eastern Europe. Uh, they also included a strong dose of racism. But anti-Semitism was uh, one of the central organizing principles of it. And in the U.S. today, while anti-Semitism is still a vicious part of the hatred that fascists try to increase, uh, and we've seen some horrific attacks on synagogues um, and on the uh, Holocaust Museum and murders uh, as that re result of that anti-Semitism. But the central focus of the right in this country is on racism, both against uh, African Americans, Asian Americans, Latino Americans, and Native Americans, but also Let's be real, the attacks on immigrants, where they talk about, oh, all the immigrants, there's a strong racist component to the attacks on immigrants. It's about Muslims, it's about people of color, it's about um, people trying to escape here uh, from fascism in their own countries. 
Um, so the, the mix of the, the, these uh, toxic ideologies uh, varies from country to country, and we need to take that into account. Uh, Anti-immigrant xenophobia is a point of unity at the current moment internationally for most of the fascist groups around the world, in France, in Germany, in Scandinavia, Denmark, the Netherlands, and elsewhere. Uh, they're particularly focused on uh, attacks on immigrants, on what they call remigration, which is a, a, a nicer word than deportation. Um, so we need to recognize that we have to fight racism, the anti-immigrant xenophobia, and anti-Semitism, uh, and also recognize that the racism against African Americans in particular is a, a central part of the fascist movement in this country. So the key point of building unity is the struggle against racism, and it, the racism is the biggest obstacle to unity. It's the main, though not the only way, in which the ultra-right appeals and Trump appeal to a mass base here in the United States. Racism unites ultra-right movements. Racism divides people's movements. It's the main obstacle to building the necessary alliances, coalitions, and working partnerships. Third, without multiracial unity against racism, all other battles and alliances will be weaker. The anti-racist, anti-police violence and Black Lives Matter movements are at historic highs, supported by many millions, by majorities in many places. And the fight against racism is an essential part of the fight to protect and expand democracy so that the people of this country will actually get to decide uh, before the fascists get a chance to um, uh, drown us all in blood. So just as our working class is multiracial, multinational, multigender, multigenerational, so to the movement to defeat steps towards fascism, steps against democracy, against civil rights of all kinds, against the right to protest and organize, must be multiracial, multinational, multigender, gender, multigenerational. I should also note this also holds true of the current uh, fascination of the ultra-right with uh, demonizing uh, trans folks. Uh, they're passing laws, they're making ridiculous, outrageous statements. They're trying to whip up hysteria. Uh, it's, it, it's not because they believe any of this stuff. In fact, in Germany, uh, along with communists and some social democrats, uh, homosexuals were among the first who were sent to concentration camps even though some of the Nazi leaders themselves were homosexuals. So it's, it was not about what they believed or what they wanted for themselves. It was a political tool to use against the left and against unity. So I'm gonna go through a, a third section here where uh, there's a myth that Hitler was elected. And I want to talk about this in several aspects. And after I finish this section, we'll open the floor for questions and comments for a while. This myth that Hitler was elected is used to discourage us from using electoral struggle to inflict a defeat on the fascist elements who are seeking to use elections to grab more power. Unintentionally or intentionally, this myth is used to demoralize opposition to the fascists, arguing that elections don't defeat fascists, so why bother? Well, as I noted before, elections by themselves are not the only tool we need to defeat fascists, but they are a key way. It's a key way they are trying to gain power, and it's a key way that we can defeat them. It's not the only defeat that has to be inflicted, and no matter how strong the defeat is this fall for fascism, the fascists aren't going away. They've had a taste of power, and they are uh, eager uh, to get more of it. 
Uh, so we will have to continue the struggle after the elections, street demonstrations, uh, strikes, uh, uh, legal battles, as uh, there are some Haitian uh, groups in Ohio who are suing Trump and Vance for lying about Springfield, Ohio. Uh, so there's legal street union, electoral uh, petitions, boycotts, any wide range of tactics that we can use to continue the fight against fascism after this election is over. But we definitely should bother with this election. So it is true that Hitler and the Nazi party were the single largest party in Germany in 1932, the single largest voting bloc. And strictly speaking, Hitler became chancellor through the mechanisms of the German constitution of the time. And Hitler and the Nazi party for many years pursued a strategy of building up their appeal to German voters as a key element of their drive for power. So all of those things are true. Hitler and the Nazis did take advantage of the electoral system. They used the electoral system. Uh, they uh, manipulated it, um, but while they relied at the start on a mainly, though not solely, electoral strategy, uh, they, which is different than most forms of fascism that we've seen, of course, once firmly in power, they did away with any pretense of democratic elections. Much more typical of fascists is that they come to power through mil military means. In Italy, it was a march on Rome. In Spain, it was the Spanish Civil War. Um, in Chile, there was also a, a reflection of the Spanish Civil War. Uh, in Portugal, in Chile, there was a fascist coup by the military. In Japan, it was the military allied with the remnants of a feudal government. Uh, in Greece in the 1960s, it was a military coup. In Brazil in the mid 70s, it was a military coup. So we shouldn't have any pre preconceived notions about fascism coming to power in any one particular way. They will use whatever tools come to hand. The immediate cause of Hitler's appointment as chancellor came as a direct result of pressure from German militarists and industrialists like Krupp and Thyssen and others in the early days of 1993. And I'll get to some details about the timing in a moment. Even the day before the appointment, Hindenburg, the president, had publicly stated that he was not appointing and would not appoint Hitler. So there was an intense amount of pressure placed on him to reverse his long-standing claim that he would uh, not have anything to do with the Nazis. During the two years prior, Hitler had made it his personal priority, in addition to his public speaking, to whip up mass support, which is what everybody talks about, his the giant rallies and his odd, though charismatic, speaking style. He also worked behind the scenes to connect to and reassure German financial elites. He understood that the Nazis would not come to power only through direct electoral means, that he needed the active support of major traditional power elites, the financial elite and the military elite. He and the Nazis leaders worked hard to make connections and ties, and it paid off for them. As I mentioned, I believe, uh, in the last session, there was a particular meeting in, I'm not sure if it was October or November of uh, 1932, where Hitler, it was a secret meeting that Hitler had with Krupp, Weissen, and, and other leading industrialists, where he reassured them that some of his radical sounding rhetoric uh, about being against corporations and big business was just rhetoric, and he would, in fact, uh, lead in a way that benefited them. So that, that meeting laid the basis for those same uh, financial leaders to put pressure on Hindenburg to appoint Hitler. <clears throat> now, why did it happen when it happened? 
uh, one of the key things this, while it was still the largest single party, Nazi vote totals had started to decline. So I just took a, a selection of vote totals. Uh, there were many more elections than this, but this is just a, a sampling. In 1924, shortly after the attempted coup in Munich, the Nazis got 2 million votes. In 1928, that had sunk to 800,000 votes. However, with the coming of the Great Depression, with the crisis of all society, with mass unemployment, with the economy in free fall, with, in Germany in particular, massive inflation, in July of 1932, the Nazis got 37% of the vote, which was their peak, while the combined socialist and communist vote was 35%, almost as big, but not quite. Then there was another round of elections in 1932 in November, and the Nazi vote had declined to less than 12 million, which was 33%. So they lost four to five percent of their vote in over a period of about five months, while the combined socialist and communist vote totaled 36.8. It had grown uh, by two percent. So the trajectory of those vote totals played a key role in why those German industrialists and militarists who previously had scorned the Nazis, or at least not supported them, uh, decided to throw their weight behind the appointment of Hitler as chancellor. They thought that would be their last chance to exercise the fascist option. Otherwise, they might face a left-wing revolution or a left-wing electoral victory that would lead to policies not in their favor. So they said, if we don't pick the Nazis now, we might lose the chance. This is our last chance to maintain our rule uh, in the rise of this, uh, in the face of this rising left vote and left working class alliances that were being built. So that's a little bit about why that happened when it happened. So I'd like to uh, open the floor for some uh, any questions or comments uh, before we get to the reports from uh, several of the, your fellow students. OK, uh, the usual procedure, we're looking for raised hands. If you have a question or you have a comment, Dimitri, we've opened the mic on our end. There you are. Thank you very much. And thank you again for an excellent presentation. There's one detail that I would like to add that I think is salient. We had the election early January 1933. Hitler wins a, a large number, certainly not enough to form a government. But in the meantime, ask the former government. Then, if I'm not mistaken, within five to 10 days, the Reichstag fire burns down the parliament building, after which the communists are blamed for this terrorist activity. We know it was the fascist, but because they were blamed, they were arrested, murdered in the streets, and not allowed to participate in the upcoming election. So when you say, where were the communists when Hitler came to power? They were arrested and murdered, and there comes Dimitrov, who was then accused falsely of this Reichstag fire, burning the, the Congress down, and they broadcast the court case, and he tears Goebbels apart and is exiled from Germany. So look how deeply involved Dimitrov is in this lie, which imprisoned and murdered our comrades, so the election was held without the Communist Party. Sorry for getting upset. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the Reichstag fire happened after Hitler was appointed chancellor and that his appointment as chancellor allowed them to seize on this excuse to try and crush the Communist Party and 
all democratic people eventually didn't start out that way. It was the first a major step towards the audacious seizing of power. Are there others? Yes. Honor. Um, so I, I, I haven't been able to go to the other uh, webinars recently. I'm sorry about that. I've uh, had a lot of work recently. Um, uh, but but so if this is something that's been touched on previously, I'd like to you know preemptively apologize. Uh, but one thing I noticed, uh, especially about like far right radicals, is like before they like get to the part where they're you know super racist, obviously, is that a lot of them have like the same complaints as uh, as we do about the system, and they're experiencing the inequality. Um, and so, you know, you know, and, you know, eventually someone gets in their ear and starts feeding them all this, uh, all this stuff about how, uh, it's like, uh, I, I know that one guy was like, oh, it's the Jews that, you know, cause all of this, you know, the, the global Jewish elite. So I, I, I'm wondering if like, if it's possible for them to like, get out of that when they realize that it's, you know, it, it's not a group of, or a nationality that's oppressing them it's like you know the corporate elite i wonder if that's at all possible i'll, I'll take a couple more questions if there or comments okay zachary okay uh my question was about uh just how fascist movements tend to be towards um it directed in a military scale we recently saw this attempt in bolivia to do a coup uh and it was stopped by a mass movement there was even a general strike called my question is around the United States' movement towards fascism with the MAGA, right? Um, there, I, I have family in the military, and I have always seen the military as a very far-right place. Um, it kind of concerns me about just how right-wing that is, and if a Trump presidency were to take hold... Um, you know, would would the military only be used? I mean, he's hinted at it, obviously, with the deportation of um, migrants and the uh, a, a stat, like the uh, enforcement of laws regarding protests using the military. But um, something that had just kind of sparked in my head is, should we be organizing anti-fascist spaces within the military? Uh, has it been effective in the past? Is that even a direction um, that, you know, we would want to head uh, as a party or just as an anti-fascist movement in general. Thanks. Tanya? Yes, there. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wonderful uh, uh, presentation. I just have a, a comment question. Um, in uh, some uh, bourgeois circles and the uh, general discussion, they try to explain this right-wing fascist tendency as a mental health issue. You find their diagnosis of uh, these people as narcissistic and so on. And uh, uh, they tend to put so much importance on them as being a cult. Um, and uh, I think that Mark laid out a very, very important materialist dialectic interpretation of what is going on. Now, in trying to uh, engage with this, how do what's the best approach that uh, of balancing of trying to um, uh, 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 in, I mean um, take note of that, but uh, uh, you know uh, come up with the conclusion that I think you are suggesting here. It is becoming quite widespread. I have seen a lot of every every point in the media, they are trying to talk about narcissistic, this and that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and people are, are, they are, uh, they are in a cult. They have to, as if it is a kind of a spiritual, uh, kind of idealistic uh, uh, problem. Thank you. Okay. okay. Mark, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll, so let me respond to a couple of these and then we'll move on to the presentations by some other participants. The fascists 
specifically design their program to try to appeal to the real problems faced by workers. They do talk about, uh, you know, the big banks and <clears throat> various other things. They merge it with their anti-Semitism, but part of their goal is to appeal to workers and the real problems they face. Uh, I'll, I'll note two things. One, this is the reason why there's socialist in the name of the Nazi party. The, it's, it's the uh, national uh, social, you know, it's national socialism, they called it. Didn't have anything to do with socialism, but socialist, the word socialism had a powerful appeal to the German working class at the time. Uh, that was why they included it in the name, not because much of their program had anything to do with socialism. I'll also note that, um, so the first uh, uh, groups that were attacked after Hitler's appointment and the Reichstag fire and the beginning uh, to set up concentration camps were uh, communists and socialists and homosexuals, and they also threw in petty criminals to that. Uh, but very shortly after that, as part of consolidating power, they, uh, Trump, I mean, um, Hitler, <laughs> uh, turned on, uh, I think his name was Georg Strasser, who was a Nazi leader. I think he was the leader of the brown shirts. And there was a, it's called the Night of the, Nong, N Night of the Long Knives, when all of these parts of the Nazi militia were arrested and imprisoned as well because they had been snookered into believing the anti-capitalist part of the Nazi rhetoric. And uh, Hitler was tired of uh, the pressure that he got from them and having to appease them. He thought he didn't have to do it anymore. So many of them also died. Um, so that, that appeal to workers is real in the sense that they do talk about some real issues, uh, but it's not real in the sense that they intend to actually address any of those problems. Uh, moving on to Zach's question about the fascists in the military. Um, it's, a, it's a complex uh, question. Uh, the history of the military in different countries plays a, um, an important role in how prominent uh, the military is in implementing fascism. In some of the countries, uh, it's an appeal to um, the, uh, the members of the military and the leaders of the military, as Mussolini did. In others, it's, in, as in Spain, it's Franco leading a revolt of the much of the army against the um, democratically elected Popular Front government of Spain. Uh, in Chile, um, there was a long history of constitutional government, a long history of keeping the military out of politics, both not dissimilar to our own situation. However, when push came to shove, they had no compunction in Chile about utilizing the military, and the, mili the military was the basis of the fascist coup. Uh, the sec one section of the military fighting against other sections of the military. Um, and there's a fascinating discussion in a book that I highly recommend called Allende's Chile by Edward Boerstein from International Publishers. Um, I'll talk more about this next time, but he has a, a discussion of uh, should they have armed the people? Should they have made more of an effort to organize in the military? And Burstein argues that they were correct uh, not to try and um, just you know hand out weapons to the populace in general. That would have been the trigger for an immediate fascist coup. However, he argues that uh, the Popular Unity Coalition uh, didn't make enough of an effort to appeal to the rank and file of the military. There was a leader of the Socialist Party who uh, did make a, a concerted effort to 
hold events and uh, speak directly to the rank and file of the military. And, he, and Borstein suggests that they should have done more of that, that even though that was risky, that would have been, um, it would have put the government in a stronger position. Um, so right now, thus far, the military leadership has stayed out of it and has stuck by, um, you know, the military staying out of politics and uh, with some notable exceptions like uh, General Flynn. Uh, but for the most part, they have uh, uh, resisted or uh, been hesitant to follow the worst uh, Trump plans. Uh, that's no guarantee. And it would be a positive step to find ways to try and organize among the rank and file of the military. The rank and file are mainly come from the working class. So that's the basis on which to appeal to them and appeal to them to be ready to resist orders from the higher ups who might not have the same uh, interests. Um, and talking about the mental health issue, yeah, there's uh, fa yeah, fascism and the fascist organizations, they are cults, that's true, uh, and their leaders certainly exhibit uh, massive amounts of narcissism and egotism and uh, bullying behaviors and all of that. However, if we reduce the fascist danger to the psyche of Trump or the psyche of Hitler, that the reason that it, that fascism happens, as we discussed a little bit last time, is that the ruling class is no longer able to effectively rule in the old way, and the left-wing movement is not yet strong enough to uh, to take take power. Um, that doesn't have much to do with the psyche of any individual. Uh, so that, while it's interesting to read some of those studies, uh, it's addressing the mental health aspect of it is not going to have make a fundamental difference because it's not mainly their narcissism which causes fascism to uh, gain power. It's mainly their organization and their demagoguery and their the confusion and chaos that they spread. Uh, and even if we solve the narcissism problem of one or another leader, <laughs> that wouldn't change um, that, that reality, that it's the underlying political and economic causes that underlie when fascism tries to take power and is in a powerful enough position. So I'd like to now you must be tired of hearing me talk, so I'd like to um, move to the three sections. Uh, Marnia is doing the first section of Dimitrov's report, Fascism and the Working Class. Then Walker with section two, the United Front of the Working Class Against Fascism. And then Devon on the first section of Dimitrov's summary, the unity of the working class against fascism. So I propose that we hear all three. They each have up to five minutes to present those sections and what they think we can uh, uh, learn by hearing about them. And then the floor will be open for more discussion and questions, including questions on everything presented up to this point. So we'll start with Marnia on uh, the first section of Dimitrov's United Front Against Fascism report. Okay, you have the floor. Hi. Um, Hi. Okay, thank you for saying my name right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I guess I, I'll start with just the main points I took away and then I'll kind of add some details if that's okay. So the main parts of my part of this reading was that fascism is always a threat. Um, another takeaway was it can be prevented, but it needs to be taken seriously. Um, fascism by nature is unstable and as it progresses, it just gets like life gets worse for everybody and it tends to kick kickstart a proletarian front. Um, and then let's see. So yeah, that was basically um, my takeaway that it can be overcome, but it takes a real serious um, 
organization. Um, since fascism is always a threat, my first point, um, uniting workers and peasants beforehand can prevent it. Um, ignoring it will make it worse. Um, the one line I really, really resonated with me that I've always thought but didn't really have the words for is that fascism is the power of finance capital. And this really resounded with me because of the fact that our Supreme Court, which we know is very corrupt, years ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago, said money equals free speech. That completely gives them, you know, you have more money, you have more free speech. So what is that, you know? Um, something that somebody asked about and that you had mentioned, Mark, um, the, the rhetoric resonates with those proletarian that feel left behind by the Democrats. Um, and this was happening pre-World War II. So reading this really felt like I was reading current events and not so much history. Um, but it says that it exploits the nation or exploits the masses and it appeals to urgent needs and presents as a champion of an, of an ill-treated nation which is so much going on right now. Um, you know, the immigrants are doing it, the poor people, the homeless. Um, we're just, you know, the whole American, America first rhetoric really is what this really sounded like to me. Um, it says it tries to exterminate the opposition, which Trump has promised he would try to do. Um, and it comes to power when the working class is split. And this is a huge thing right now. My dad was a union guy. And he's ready to vote for Trump. I mean, and he feels ignored and that the coastal elites have all the power. And that's, you know, really dangerous. Um, the can be prevented part, but needs to be taken seriously. We have to have a united front. And I think someone named Charlie asked, like, what can we do? Like, what are some things we can do? We need anti-fascist militias. Uh, social programs like Social Security, food stamps, things that actually help the working class and poor. We have to tax the rich. We need a militant working class, a strong revolutionary party, and a correct policy towards proletarian and peasants, and vigilant and timely action. And then um, the fact that it's unstable and it gets worse, it doesn't mean that um, that it will collapse on its own. It has to, the proletarian has to exploit the weaknesses. Um, let's see, they establish a political monopoly too, um, to kind of keep everybody um, like under their rule, uh, just like Hitler did, obviously. Um, and they try to shift the burden of crisis to workers. And I thought that was really interesting because it harkens back to, making us recycle you know like why are they why are corporations making the stuff they're passing the buck to us um in pollution we've just dysregulated or disempowered the epa um you know that's and then i said um repartitioning the world through war really made me think of gaza um a lot of nods to neo-colonialism uh neoliberalism in this article um, but yeah, I guess that's probably at least five minutes of synopsis. I could have more if you want. No, that's, that's good. That's exactly what we wanted. Uh, the next section is the second section of the report, United Front of the Working Class Against Fascism, and Walker volunteered to take that on. Okay, looking for Walker. Walker, open your mic, click, there you are. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Walker. I'm a member of the Louisiana Club. Um, so I'm going to briefly discuss the main points of the second section titled the United Front of the Working Class Against Fascism. Uh, so this section is focused on justifying the creation of a united front. Uh, and I've identified uh, three key themes that Dimitrov uses. So the, the first theme is that a united front will help to grow the party. Um, the second theme is that we have a, a duty to stop fascism in the bourgeois uh, hegemon countries for the benefit of the world. And the third is that we have a duty to protect the proletariat regardless of their beliefs. Um, so on that first point that a united front will help to grow the party, um, 
the strategy, he says, will, quote, exert tremendous influence on all other strata of working people. Uh, I believe he's referring there to non-communist or even reactionary working groups. Um, this will allow us to unite the working class before making them agree with us about everything. Um, particularly, we can create a unified block of unions and union voters, um, which is crucial to create uh, what Dimitrov refers to as nonpartisan working class bodies. Uh, so this display of unity um, is particularly important to oppressed identity groups who would be early targets for a fascist government. Uh, Dimitrov uses the example of women's anti-fascist organizations um, and mentions that we would alienate our allies in these groups if we don't do everything in our power to fight fascism now. Um, it's important to note that a dictatorship of the proletariat is not the immediate goal of the United Front. Uh, the United Front is a feature that can only exist under bourgeois democracy, but by building up the party in this way, it is a step toward that goal. Um, so kind of the, the, the key of this point is that we must train the, the workers to fight fascism right now. Um, Dimitrov repeats the quote uh, that they must learn, master, and apply the anti-fascist struggle. Uh, the second theme identified that we have a duty to stop uh, fascism here in America, um, particularly because it is a Western economic and military superpower. And Dimitrov talks about the U.S., um, France, and Britain uh, when making this point, but they're, they're, all the points he makes are, are relevant to the U.S. Uh, because of that status. Um, so it shows international solidarity for us to put aside our qualms uh, based on the domestic political situation in order to fight the right wing. Because if the right wing takes power in the United States, it's it's going to have an influence on uh, ideology and and workers' movements in the entire world. Um, so the the front functions uh, differently depending on national context. Which here uh, we have a two-party system and um, relatively weak unions. Um, so we have to work uh, within the hand we've been dealt, basically. Um, US fascism is portraying itself as, uh, quote, the custodian of the Constitution in American democracy, while simultaneously trying to undermine those institutions, which we understand to actually be crucial to the anti-fascist struggle. Uh, and then the third point, that we have a duty to protect the proletariat regardless of their beliefs. Um, Dimitrov's suggestion for strategy is that we combine the basic needs of the proletariat with those of her allies, um, which Dimitrov identifies as the peasantry and the petite bourgeoisie. Um, because a divided working class, regardless of their ideology, will only cause more suffering to the workers. So it's better for us to help build a unified working class political bloc um, and then work on radicalization or bring them in to uh, the communist movement um, once we've kind of established unity there. And this is part of what distinguishes our strategy from that of the fascists. Dimitrov uses the example of Nazi Germany and its heterogeneous coalition, which claimed to represent all classes of German society, whereas we acknowledge what class we are here to represent. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be willing to work in good faith with adjacent classes, whereas the Nazis were deceptively claiming to represent everybody. Uh, so that's probably my time. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And the, the third section is from Devin. Devin, your mic is open on our end. OK, so for the section that I was given, I wrote up a uh, short summary of the section. and my thoughts on it. So without further ado, I go, as we all know, there are different material conditions for each nation, regardless of the government structure. And as an internationalist party, it's our duty as communists to not only mutually aid other nations, but to allow them to determine their own best course of development, given their specific material conditions, and to do what we can to enable them to grow and thrive. Growing and thriving of all nations should be a main goal of socialists to help this happen. And as stated in the text, we need to study and take into account the special features of the development of fascism and the various forms of fascist dictatorship 
in the individual countries at its various stages. In the USA, of course, we can spend perhaps weeks discussing the course of development of fascist and reactionary ideology and their dialectical material effects on the nation and indeed the world. But as the text also states, quote, it would be a gross mistake to lay down any sort of universal scheme for development of fascism valid for all countries and all peoples. And this is no less true for the USA. We can draw parallels, but how fascist thought grows and implements will, of course, be different in the USA than in other countries. But we can identify rightly identify problematic policies, individuals and groups, or ideologies, and it will be very different, hence not perhaps so easy to identify as, say, an incipient genocide or ethnic cleansing. These things, however, tend to be at least desired, if not actively occurring, by the fascist elements. Dimitrov also notes, quote, it would be short-sighted not to notice the uninterrupted growth there fascist peril or to underestimate the possibility of a fascist coup d'etat. Indeed, in the USA, we have already seen a dramatic surge in fascist desires for ethnic cleansing and a coup d'etat on behalf of the MAGA Republicans. It would be a terrible miscalculation to assume that it wouldn't happen or couldn't happen because we have a democracy. So did Germany, for Hitler seized power. Turns out that when enough people have had enough of whatever they feel is going on that they dislike or want to see go away, they will not resist a hostile takeover of the government. So we should not end up underestimate the power of a mass revolt. We know that many sects within the modern movement are calling for a new civil war or a revolution, as they want to call it, with even some members of Congress saying that we are in the midst of a revolution and that it will, quote, remain bloodless if the left allows it to be. And I say left in quotes because there's no major left-leaning politician of any particular note, but it's colloquial come to me, anyone who is not a conservative Christian or is, quote, woke. Now let's note that woke is a concept based heavily on the old Nazi concept of cultural Bolshevism. There is indeed a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two concepts, and anti-woke is and should rightly be identified as a fascist belief system and called out as such when we see it. Anti-woke is engineered by neo-Nazis and other fascist groups, and it hates everything that we as communists should uphold and support. This is, of course, a horrifying sentiment for a congressperson to say openly because it seems that many truly believe it is their God-given duty to save the USA and their other Christian compatriots from woke politics and the quote, attack on Christian family values whenever they, or whatever they might take these individual terms to mean. When they say they want to take over, we need to believe them. As he says, it, as he says, quote, it would likewise be dangerous to cherish illusions regarding the weakness of fascism in other countries where it does not have a broad, vast base. We have the examples of such countries as Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, and Finland, where fascism, although it had no broad base, came to power relying on the armed forces of the state and then sought to broaden its base by making use of the state apparatus, quote, unquote. This is exactly what Project 2025 is setting out to do. It wants to slowly expel and replace members of small state organizations with MAGA loyalists, which is not difficult to find examples of times where these slow but measured changes in leadership led to a full-scale hostile takeover by fascists without or with or without mass support, which the USA definitely has. And I believe that's what like 48% of the population at least tangentially support Trump and the MAGA Republicans. Anyway, so it would be a horrible mistake to believe that they are without enough support. Dimitrov warned the tendency of some less principled groups in his time to, quote, substitute general non-committal formulas for a, for a careful and concrete study 
of the actual situations and relationships of class forces and cautions us not to emulate these groups and to take into account the dialectical material relationships between the classes as we see them in action and to take unified principled and most of all organized action against anything in our power to act against. These non-committal formulas might continue to fracture and split off into other ultra-left parties and become a group of essentially debate bros online but do nothing of consequence in real life or still they may become openly reactionary and actually join the fascist movement while claiming to still be on the left or state claiming to still be communists. This only weakens the working class resolve because now, perhaps more than ever, it is our time to move in lockstep, take heed of real material conditions and forces, and act with democratic centralism to respond to current events. We need to agitate, educate, and organize our fellow comrades and engage in direct action against the ever-growing fascist MAGA Republican and indeed even the so-called MAGA Communist tide, which is already growing and beginning to fracture even our own party into malignant reactionary Duganist splinter cells. We cannot allow this to keep happening. Dimitrov ends with some encouragement, however, quote, we comrades as communist fighters in the labor movement, as reactionary, as a revolutionary vanguard, let's not be reactionary, of the working class want to be the sharpshooters who unfailingly hit the target. So let's stay on track. Let's accurately take aim at the fascists and their ideologies and continue to take direct action against them in whatever way we can, with principle and in earnest. That's what I got. Thanks very much. So I wanna thank Marnia, Walker and Devon for doing that. We'll have a couple of more students on Thursday and a couple of others on Saturday take on uh, different sections of Togliati's lectures on fascism and on Saturday talking about the party program. We have about 20 minutes of uh, or 15 minutes for uh, the floor to be open and for general discussion. Um, just a, a couple of points that I uh, make from the, the three reports we've had. Um, I, we said before that fascism represents a toxic stew of reactionary I ideology, and it doesn't make sense. And it's not supposed to make sense. It's supposed to be different, discrete elements that appeal to different sections of the people. It's not supposed to be a coherent whole. Uh, but that led some, as Dimitrov notes, to uh, just be amazed, as many of us are, how could people believe this crap? Um, but if it's crap and then you don't take it seriously, uh, it, it spreads uh, like a virus. Um, I'm not, I'd, not sure about, uh, I agree with all of the steps Marnia talked about, about what we need to do now, except for the left-wing militia part. That's something that has to be determined by the actual concrete circumstances, not by um, a sort of uh, a priori uh, decision that doesn't take those into account. Right now, the democratic movement includes millions of people who are disgusted by the idea of violence in politics. So that has to be an element of what we consider. Um, I just, just also note in this talk about, well, um, there's a united front, a popular front. I'll talk a little bit more about the the differences in those two things because that gets very confusing. I'll talk about that next time. Um, but the the purpose of the United Front is not just to, um, uh, you know, be a version of, well, we're going to uh, ally with people and then uh, over time uh, it's it's a, a, a recruiting vehicle or something. Uh, that, that can be an element of it, but a coalition or alliance is by definition an agreement to work together by organizations and people who disagree on major things. We're not going to agree with lots of 
other people who are also opposed to fascism. They, you know, they have they have their own reasons for it. Uh, they have their own interests, and those might not necessarily be solely working class interests. So we have to recognize that an alliance is not simply um, people coming to us. It includes us going to them and learning from them and building alliances on what we can work with and recognizing that we don't agree and will not necessarily ever agree on uh, major and important things. Uh, nonetheless, the alliance, which makes it massive enough to actually play a role in defeating fascism, that's the, the key part. So uh, let's open the floor for uh, up till about uh, 25 after, and then I'll just have some concluding things. So the, the floor is open for questions or comments. Stefan? So this is kind of more on, um, I think it was Devin or, yeah, was it Devin or Walker that, sorry, um, basically just about in striving to unite with and protect workers, whether they're urban, rural, petty bourgeois, why is it important um, to be clear and unapologetic about fighting for sections of our class who are subjected to additional layers of oppression? um why why is that important and how do we need to um articulate that when we have comrades you know casting themselves as working class heroes because they reject what they call like woke identity politics and and all that kind of stuff thank you okay others sean thank you so much um, I had a question about um, something Dimitrov says in uh, the section Chief Arguments of the Opponents of the United Front. Um, he said something that confused me a little bit, and so I thought maybe I'd ask for some context to help me understand. Um, um, in, in summary, he's making, um, he's his, his opponents are saying um, that the bourgeois democratic parties are better allies against fascism than the communists. And Dimitrov goes on to talk about why um, it has to include the communists. Um, but he, he seems to be going so far as to say that the, um, that the bourgeois democratic parties um, should not be included in that coalition. So that confused me because I know that's, you know, how we apply our unite front. So I wanted to see, am I misunderstanding that or am I just missing some context? Thank you so much. This presentation has been amazing. Thanks. Okay, Marnia has her hand you go on mine's just kind of a basic question and i'm not sure if i asked this before but are all these slides going to be available in like an email or a document we're going to get okay looking for more raised hands connor your mic is open on our end there hi. you are hi uh so in regards to the whole you know militia thing i noticed there was a disagreement there uh, I absolutely agree, you know, actively seeking out violence. No, that's, you know, the, the, that's not what we're about. And I don't think it should be. Um, but certainly, uh, like in the wake of all of these like reactionary, like violent movements, you know, you saw these groups like the Proud Boys or uh, the people at Charlottesville, uh, you, you know, when our enemy is so like unapologetically violent and you know they seem to be confident enough to just go out and straight up attack people like my 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 question is like should we like just have like the ability to defend ourselves from that violence because you know you you, you can't trust uh, uh uh cops to really do the right thing so at a certain point, you know, you have to be able to defend yourself. And I think that's uh, really important for the movement. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I could be wrong. That's just my basic initial thoughts. Okay. Well, let me, let me respond to a couple of these and uh, we'll see where we are. Um, why it's important to fight for the unity of all, to fight for the interests of all sections of the people, uh, oppressed peoples, uh, those who are exploited, whether they're 
industrial workers or service workers or a rural workers or whatever section or whatever group that's uh, being attacked. It's a central part of the fascist ideology to use those as tools to split the working class movement, to split their opposition, to, um, to disarm us, uh, to get in the way of broad-based unity. To create that broad-based unity, we have to recognize, we have to fight against those tools of division, have to fight against racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, transphobia, uh, anti-woman stuff. I mean, don't, there's a whole long list of attacks on women's health and women's rights and uh, women's role in society. Um, and uh, so we want it's it does two things it takes away a weapon from our opponents and it strengthens our unity to recognize that um, different people face different aspects and different kinds of oppression different amounts of oppression some is double layered or triple layered some of it is um, uh, relates to geography some of it relates to culture um, so we're we're fighting for that unity and we're fighting to take away a weapon from our opponents and it's why they're there you hear them talk about uh trans people all the time they want laws about bathrooms and laws about who can be on sports teams and laws about this it doesn't have anything to do with their really being in favor of those laws or not it's a tool they're using to try and beat the movement to try and divide the movement to stop the movement from gaining the unity that we need. Um, and uh, so that's a little on that, on, on this issue of Dimitrov talking about uh, bourgeois parties. Uh, in, in the conditions of, say, uh, Italy or Germany in the 1930s, there were both uh, communist and socialist political parties. There were also communist and socialist led union federations. And there were also socialist and communist ex-military organizations. Um, and at that point, it was possible to have, uh, say, formal agreements between those parties, agreements to work together jointly. Uh, it happened in some places, it didn't happen in others. Um, and in those cases, the, some of the uh, traditional politicians said, oh, don't go, don't, don't go to the left, put your trust in us, even while they were maneuvering behind the scenes um, to use the fascist threat to bolster their own their own bourgeois political party. If you read William Shearer's uh, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, there's uh, you know chapters of the, uh, the, the vacillation and deviation and, um, uh, and self-interest of bourgeois political leaders who are trying to uh, use the fascist threat to bolster their own political choices. Um, in our country, we don't have exactly the same situation, and we are certainly not going to, the Democratic Party and the Communist Party are not going to come to any kind of agreement on anything, uh, the, the Democratic Party as a whole, as a national entity. Um, so it's not like there's going to be the same kind of formal alliance that there was the potential for in Europe in the 1930s, because our political structure is different. Our political parties are very different. Um, so it, it's, we're, we're not talking about, you know, we're going to get a building somewhere, we're going to put up a big sign that says United Front Against Fascism, and everybody's going to join it, and all the different parties will sign. It's, uh, it's a, a much more, um, how to, how to say it, not, not splintered, but there, people talk about the silos. Everybody's in their own silo, and it's our job to break down those silos. And to the degree that there are politicians from 
the Democratic or Republican Party who are opposed to fascism and are ready to take action against fascism, we welcome that action, even though there's no there, there's no formal organization, no formal coalition, no formal uh, alliance. Nonetheless, we are proceeding uh, on different tracks to fight fascism in many different ways, and we need to welcome everybody to that struggle. Partly because we need that unity to have the strength to defeat the fascists, and uh, partly because uh, that's the, the the path to uh, defeating fascism is the path of a unity for a progressive program. So we're we're assembling the forces we need to not just defeat fascism, but then move on to the next stage of struggle. Uh, yes, the slides are available. In a minute, I'll put up my email address again, corrected this time. So anybody who wants these slides can have them. And I also understand there's a recording of the slideshow and our conversation that will also be available. Uh, so if you want just a copy of the slides, email me directly and I'll be glad to send them to you. Um, on Connor, the yes, my, in my opinion, uh, the, the time is not now for a malicious, but a self-defense against fascist attacks is absolutely what should happen. However, we have to recognize that's not a political strategy to politically defeat fascists. It's a ne necessary step to defend the movement when it is violently attacked and self-defense and organized self-defense and uh, not being afraid to uh, directly confront the fascists, that's all Think those are all things we are going to do. But organizing a militia is not going to politically defeat the fascists. And that's our goal. So that's why our focus is on the political defeat. Uh, it's also important that we not get so scared by the fascists that we turn inwards. We have to, you know, uh, the best defense is a good offense, and the best offense against fascism is a broad-based political alliances that tackle and challenge fascism wherever it is in whatever ways possible, through the electoral system, through the legal system, through community organization, in unions, through strikes, through boycotts, through general strikes. All of these tools are political tools that we need to defeat fascism politically in the broadest way possible, with the broadest possible unity. And when we turn inwards and say, well, we should, um, yes, we're opposed to the fascists, but we have to um, become so security conscious that we don't engage with the mass movement. That would be a mistake. Um, so I think that's addressing those. Let me just, there's my correct email address. Uh, if you have questions about the dialectical method, I'll recommend my own book, Green Strategy, from International Publishers, which has a, an entire section uh, using environmental issues to explain dialectics and using dialectics to explain environmental issues. Uh, Mickey, uh, who was a participant in the first session, uh, uh, sent me a note. There's a short biography of Dimitrov online. Not it's a, it's actually it's a medium length. Uh, it's a, you know multiple pages, uh, but there's the link to that. And if you uh, do want a copy of the slideshow, you'll be able to click on uh, these various links. There's also articles and presentations on our party website. Uh, some articles, some uh, previous uh, webinar, a previous webinar that I did against the threat of fascism today, uh, articles about uh, how to block and build <laughs> our movement uh, in the process of the fight against fascism. So uh, these are all additional resources that you can uh, check out. Or you can do what I did, which is go to the CPUSA website and uh, click the, the um, uh, search button and search for things on fascism. They, these were just a selection that I made, but there's many more. So I, I 
urge you to, if you want a copy of the, this particular slideshow, email me and I'll be glad to send it to you. I also I want to put up a bunch of book recommendations and I'll have these on Thursday and Saturday as well. Not only the Dimitrov's from Dimitrov's speech and Togliati's lecture, which we're using for this section, uh, but there's a Rachel Maddow book, Prequel, An American Fight Against Fascism, about the fascist movement in this country in the 30s and how that links to today. There's a book I highly recommend, Allende's Chile by Edward Boerstein, which is um, fascinating in a lot of ways, and it's one of the best explanations of why strategy is important. Um, there's William Shearer's The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. He was a left-wing journalist, not particularly friendly to the communists, but a left-winger anyway, uh, and it's a masterwork of uh, the details of the coming to power of fascism and the problems within the fascist coalitions and the problems with the vacillating bourgeois politicians and all. There's a book, Fascism and Social Revolution by R. Palm Dutt, who is a leader of the British Party's theoretical work. Um, and it's sort of, uh, mm, uh, you might say, tries to uh, be a little bit in between the previous period where many communists were attacking social democrats as an obstacle to working class revolution rather than trying to unite with them to fight against fascism. So he's, he's kind of got his foot in both sides of that argument. Uh, but he also has many details about why unity between socialists and communists was so difficult. There's a book, The Communist Resistance in Nazi Germany. This is from Lawrence and Wishart, which is the British equivalent of international publishers. And it's a, a fascinating picture of the only political party to offer continuous and unending resistance to the Nazis. And a book, a novel that I recommended last time, Naked Among Wolves, which was written by a communist who was incarcerated in Buchenwald concentration camp. So he, it's a fictionalized account of that being the only concentration camp which liberated itself. Uh, of course, they were able to do so because the Allied armies were on the march and getting close. Um, it's a very hard book, but uh, uh, marvelous novel. So that's our time for today. I thank the three who uh, took on readings and presented to them to us and much appreciated. I appreciate everybody who've, who's joined us and I hope to uh, talk to you again on Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, if you get a chance, check out the vice presidential debate, which is starting in about a half an hour. So we'll see you again on Thursday and Saturday. Okay, have a good evening. Thanks very much, everyone.